there's kind of two types of capital out there that's touching the restaking market. There's the mercenary farming capital. There's look, not thinking about an, an additional maybe three to five percent on my on my native staking yield. It's the capital that's looking for basically points farming and airdrops. And then there's the capital that is the non farming bags, right? The long term holdings that does genuinely find like some additional like ETH denominated yield on their ETH holdings really interesting and something that they'd be willing to hold and you know deposit for for years right and so i think it's kind of uh unclear right now just how much of current tvl is in that long-term sort of or like long-term capital versus mercenary capital everybody's kind of gunning for that long-term capital because they know that you know the mercenary capital is kind of a vanity metric right now Hey everyone, if you have been listening to Empire, you know that Santi and I are fed up with unaffordable fees and frustrating transaction speeds that make the on-chain experience basically unusable. So the Arbitrum team reached out and they showed us the platform. They showed us what you can do on Arbitrum. Whatever you're doing, you can experience frictionless transactions at lightning speed on Arbitrum. So head over to portal.arbitrum.io and check it out. This episode is brought to you by Monad, which has not only the highest performance EVM L1 architecture ever built, but also the wildest and craziest community in crypto. Monad's internal devnet is live and public testnet comes out soon. So make sure you join the Monad community today at discord.gg forward slash Monad, M-O-N-A-D, Monad. Hey everyone, Santi and I have been talking about Solana a lot recently, and we're excited to have a Solana sponsor of Empire, Marinade. Marinade is a staking protocol on Solana and the only stake pool that delivers auto rebalancing, MEV rewards, and automatic downside protection with their new protected staking rewards. Optimize your sole stake with Marinade by hitting the link in the show notes. Big thanks to Marinade. We'll talk more about them later in the show. Are you tired of high gas fees? I'm excited to let you know about Scale, a zero gas fee modular blockchain that's become a perfect fit for gaming and AI apps because of their instant finality and lack of MEV. Explore the Scale ecosystem today at scale.space forward slash ecosystem and stay up to date with the gasless blockchain on X at Scale Network. That's at Scale Network. Big thanks to Scale for sponsoring Empire. All right, everyone, been waiting for this app for a long time. Santi and I have been talking about doing a restaking pod for a while. We needed to make sure we lined up the two best people in the world to talk about this. So we got them. We even got you a third. So uh, Santi, we put him to rest for today. We've got uh, subbing in in his place, Ryan West, otherwise known as Westy from the BlockWorks research team. We have Miles O'Neill from Reverie. You might have seen him on Bell Curve before. We've got Brandon Curtis, co-founder of Rio. Uh, guys, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm betraying Mike by going over to the other side of the, uh, the Blockworks office here, but, um, yeah, really, really happy to be here and a lot, big fan of empire. Yeah. Big fan of empire and excited to get into some of the dynamics that we see at play here in, uh, restaking. Cool. So Brandon, I'm going to pick on you for this first question. And, um, I'm not exaggerating when I say there's no one else in the world I would rather, uh, get this answer from. My question to you is there's all these things that we're talking about. There's shared security, staking, restaking, AVSs, LRTs, eigenlayer, eigenlayer competitors, supply side of the market, demand side. Walk me through basically the workflow or the supply chain or whatever you want to call it, the flow of how one ETH moves through the system from basically just like spot ETH all the way through this like restaking supply chain. Yeah, sounds good. Um, and I think this will get to some of the core issues that we want to talk about later. So it's a great place to start. Uh, so if you're a user uh, and you're interested in getting additional yield on your ETH, uh, restaking provides a mechanism to do that. Uh, there's different ways of conceptualizing it. One of the ways that I like to use uh, is this idea that normally when you have a, a token that you can stake, uh, that token basically acts as the work token uh, that you can use to validate just, just one network. Uh, and with restaking, you're basically opening that up and allowing that single uh, asset to serve as the work token to uh, validate a whole bunch of different networks potentially. So if you're uh, a user and you have some ETH and you're interested in engaging in this, uh, on, on Eigenlayer, uh, the flow looks something like this. Uh, so you'll go and you'll need to deposit into uh, a, an operator. You'll have to choose a particular operator 
Uh, and that operator is actually uh, opting into a set of these AVSs, these, these actively validated services uh, that that ETH will be restaked to, that they'll be validating. And so uh, you'll have to go and, and choose that operator. Uh, that operator is actually choosing those AVSs. And so you'll uh, deposit it to them. Uh, they'll go ahead and uh, basically point that ETH uh, at these other services that are going to be validated. Uh, and then you are uh, a little bit along for the ride. Uh, and so you don't have a choice necessarily uh, which of these services you're opting into. That happens at the operator level. And uh, if you see that an operator is adding an AVS that you're not interested in, or you don't like the risk profile of it, then the recourse you have is to unstake uh, and go and restake with a different operator. And so, yeah, a lot of, a lot of users are not really familiar with the operator ecosystem. Uh, if you're coming from like other delegated proof of stake networks, like uh, the Cosmos ecosystem, you might be more used to making these kinds of decisions. We have to weigh and measure these different operators, decide who you trust. Um, but for Ethereum, uh, normally you don't really engage with that. Uh, and so that'll be definitely a, an increase in the complexity from the end user perspective. What is the, I'm going to focus on the definitions for a second, even though for a lot of the listeners, they might be commonplace, but for some folks they're not. And I just want to hammer it home so that we, it'll, it'll tee up this conversation a little better. What is, um, what is the difference between staking and restaking? So with staking, uh, you're you're basically depositing your assets uh, into uh, a system that allows for uh, the the validation of some network. So the uh, the operator of the node on that network is doing some work to validate and order transactions and build blocks. And there are a set of rules that the network uh, will apply um, that need to be followed in order for uh, you to be rewarded uh, for that work that ends up being done. And so in the case of restaking, uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's a similar flow. So when you opt into validating another AVS, you're basically opting into another set of rules uh, for the work that needs to be done. And an AVS is not necessarily another blockchain. Many of these are services that are uh, not blockchain based. They're just uh, signing transactions and doing other things that are, you know, uh, updating oracles and, and doing other sorts of things that are conditional. Uh, on different inputs, but they're not necessarily ordering transactions or building blocks. Uh, and there's a set of rules that are applied instead of at the network level. Uh, they're actually applied in a, a set of restaking smart contracts uh, that specify the conditions under which you'll be rewarded for the work that you're doing uh, or penalized if you break those rules. And we've seen the liquid restaking protocols. So Eigenlayer basically obviously took the kind of industry by storm last year. Everyone was talking about it. Now you've seen the launch in the last couple of months of these liquid restaking protocols, Rio being one of them, others being Swell, Puffer, Renzo, EtherFi. Everyone has slightly different strategies. Um, what, like, where do LRTs insert themselves into this ecosystem? And like, why is the, what is the, kind of the value prop of an LRT? Yeah, so LRTs actually insert themselves right at the beginning of this process. Uh, so instead of the end user with this ETH that they want to get additional yield on, uh, actually going and choosing the operator themselves, they are depositing into an LRT that that takes over these other functions uh, and takes over these other responsibilities. So a liquid restaking token protocol will have a set of operators that they're working with, and they'll usually have some process for uh, selecting operators that they think will do a good job validating these networks. Uh, and then uh, the liquid restaking network as well uh, will have some process for selecting the AVSs uh, that will actually be validated by the restaking process. So all the user does is they deposit uh, their ETH, they'll receive a liquid token, this liquid restaking token, uh, which has a lot of analogies to uh, just liquid staking tokens on Ethereum. So everyone's probably familiar with you know staked ETH from Lido. Um, the only difference is that instead of just validating uh, one network, just Ethereum, uh, that uh, ETH is actually validating Ethereum, but then it's also being used to validate these, these other networks. And so the user doesn't have to make any decisions directly about what uh, operators they want to engage with uh, or what AVSs uh, they want to participate in validating. Uh, the LRT takes care of that for them and manages those risks. So all of that, you know, basically kind of unfamiliar territory for most ETH users um, that you mentioned is maybe 
slightly more familiar for Cosmos users, right? Um, that gets all abstracted away by the LRT. And so the flow feels like you're depositing to Steeth, but actually it's abstracting way more complexity under the hood than you would, you know, I guess like just depositing to a normal liquid staking protocol, right? It's, it's saying, okay, you don't have to worry about which operators your stake is touching. You don't have to worry about the AVSs that it's restaked to. You know, we're going to do a good job of picking AVSs where, you know, your, your ETH is not going to be slashed because of some crazy reason, right? Uh, we're not going to onboard operators that might, you know, go down, right? We're only onboarding high quality operators. And so from the user's perspective, that's a pretty good deal. And I think that's why we see, you know, what was it like 8 billion out of the 12.8 billion uh, deposited, you know, into Eigenlayer as, you know, coming through these LRTs. Nice. Miles, give us the content, give us almost like the state of the union. So we've got LRTs, we've got Eigen and restaking, we've got yeah. these ABSs, like where are we at today? We're recording this mid-April, like what is the size of the market and where are we at today? Yeah, sure. So Brendan did a good job kind of setting the scene on on really the technical side and I can try to set the scene on, we'll call it like the state of the marketplace, right? Um, and maybe going back to something Brandon said, we call them work tokens, right? So these are base layer L1 assets that you deposit and you earn additional, you know, yield from staking, right? There's always been a really strong desire in the market uh, to earn additional yield on these major, you know, L1 work tokens without having to take on like financial leverage, right? Or do things where your your assets could could disappear in just because of some some sort of market event, right? Um, and I think we were talking about it before the podcast started. This was actually kind of the early promise of the Lightning Network, right? Where you could take your Bitcoin and uh, earn some yield on it. Um, and without that forming, you had things like Celsius pop up. But there's still a strong desire to say, if I could earn, say, 10% on my ETH instead of just 5% without having to actually you know, take on a bunch of financial leverage risk, then there's a, it's a very strong value prop. Uh, and so you know, $13 billion of deposits um, are, are direct evidence to that. I think that's even beyond what, what anybody expected at this point. Um, and so you have it, and then, and of course the you know uh, the the primary or I guess the preferred way to to access you know this additional yield is through LRTs as we've seen the majority of of flow of funds kind of flow through them right so that's the supply side of the market is saying yes we love additional yield on our base layer asset that we already hold without having to worry about getting liquidated in the turn of in in you know in a downturn or something like that okay. Um, and then on the demand side of the market is also resonating very strongly, I think. Um, there are lots of reasons why you want your own layer one network or your own independent network that's not built as a smart contract on Ethereum or as a roll-up, right? Where you're kind of dealing with those constraints. At the same time, we've seen it's very difficult to bootstrap these you know, external networks from scratch. Um, and so you have to go out and you have to get a bunch of people to, you know, buy your token. You have to get them to lock it up. The price of the token is going to be super volatile. So you're going to have to pay them a lot of money in order to keep it locked up, right? To offset that sort of volatility risk and, and the slashing risk, of course. Um, and so what does Eigenlayer offer? It offers, you know, this pool of $13 billion, right? That is looking for opportunities to restake to. Um, and so, okay, great. Now I have access to all of this security, right? And by the way, I need operators to operate my, my network. Instead of me having to go out and like, you know, get all of these infrastructure providers to, to learn about my, you know, network and then get them to buy some tokens to, you know, or maybe have to give them tokens to, to incentivize them to come. All the operators are also sitting in one place, right? And so it's like a one-stop shop where I come in I get security I need, I get operators I need. And by the way, there's a lot of mind share like that is focused on Eigenlayer right now. And so if I choose to be, let's say, an AVS instead of some, you know, the next standalone Cosmos chain, not only am I getting like a shortcut to like actually standing up my network of operators and getting capital bootstrapped to it, 
I'm now getting the eyeballs of, you know, this 12 million, 12 billion dollars of deposits looking and, and learning about my project and, and maybe becoming, you know, interested in becoming a user or buying my token, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so the three ways I look at it are like the value prop is, you know, bootstrapping networks, uh, you know, and, and I'd say like even decentralizing, like maybe I'm not a blockchain itself. Maybe I'm a shared service to rollups. Like this is an easy way to decentralize those. Right. And then there's this kind of like Binance launch pool, almost like component of this, where you're just, you know, you have a lot of capital here and you allow them, give them a way to signal interest, like in your project. Right. And, and I think that like growth component is, is not nothing here. Um, and so we have, you know, 50 AVSs in development. Um, and I think that's, that's a lot, right? We have the Cosmos hub only has two consumer chains. We never had that many, you know, polka dot para chains. 50 is already, I think the, the, the biggest sort of like shared security platform, um, to date at the same time, uh, $13 billion is an enormous, like oversupply, I would say of deposits for how much 50 AVS is are cumulatively like realistically going to spend on security right and so you think about just like rounding off to say 10 billion even um to double the native staking yield to go from say five percent to ten percent staking yield we're going to need these avs's to spend 500 million dollars you know cumulatively on security at the very least that assumes that every single dollar is restaking to every single avs which which may not be the case likely not the case right and so despite you know i want to make it clear like this is the most successful like even so far you know um shared security platform uh we've seen to date it's still like a lot of deposits chasing after maybe yep not enough yield to go around to satisfy everybody's like expectations of, of, of the yield here. Right. If you came into Aguilar and you found out you're only going to make like 50 bips of additional yield for the next year. And we're in this, you know, ripping bull market, like you're probably going to take your assets somewhere else for yield. Um, and so like, that is the kind of the state of the marketplace where you have all of these, you know, all of the supply side going after, I would say like, you know, what they view as the highest quality AVSs and trying to find ways to make sure that only they are getting that yield, right? So I don't think all $13 billion of deposits are going to get the same yield. They're, they're kind of like going after AVSs and trying to almost, you know, if possible, block out, right, uh, additional deposits from coming in because that dilutes their own yield. Um, and this is all just like very, very normal and expected things that happen. Um, so the pricing power is with like these early AVSs uh, that, you know, everybody is kind of looking at and, and trying to get a piece of that yield. Um, now, you know, I think their early AVSs are getting sweetheart deals. Um, we can talk about that a little bit, you know, later. Yeah, but, let, um, let, Let's go there. Let's get in. So what I want to do here is like you guys are, I want to do a little inside baseball, basically. Um, I want to give folks a little bit of a look behind the scenes of what's happening and a lot of this is happening off chain. So maybe people aren't even aware that it's happening. There are a couple interesting dynamics that have evolved as the restaking space has evolved. And one of them is this dynamic between the AVSs and the LRTs. What's happening? I don't know if this is a question for Brandon or for Miles, but what, what is happening here? Yeah, I, I can set it up. Um, sure. And so I, earlier I talked about why the value prop of LRTs is so strong to depositors, right? Depositors like come in, they put their at, give their assets to an LRT and then they don't have to worry, right? But AV, uh, LRTs are actually very attractive as well to AVSs. And what I mean by this is, you know, if I'm an AVS, I'm coming into Eigenlayer and right, I want capital, uh, I want high quality operators. Um, and then I ideally don't really wanna have to worry about it things like for a while, right? Um, and I have two choices. I can either go one by one to, you know, get operators to opt in and come up with, you know, bespoke like one-to-one -one sort of agreements with all of them, right? This takes a long time. And then I'm going to have to like manage that set on an ongoing basis with say like 20 counterparties, right? It's kind of complicated. Um, or 
especially if there's an option where I can say, oh, wow, look at these huge operator blocks, uh, you know, blocks of capitals and operators. I'll just go to them. And then I have, you know, maybe two or three counterparties instead of 20 to 25, right? Because they're actually managing the relationship with the operators on my behalf. So I'm an AVS. Again, like I'm coming to Eigenlayer, I'm launching. Um, I say, I want, let's say $500 million of, of you know, security uh, restaked to my AVS. I want 10 to 20 operators. Um, well, great. I'll just go to two to three LRTs, right? And say, hey, you give me like 100, you know, you give me 200 and you give me 200 and I'm going to pick five operators from you, three from you and five from the other ones, right? Um, and then I'm done. Like that, that is the easiest way to bootstrap an AVS right now um, in this marketplace. And so we're, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the early AVS is looking at this thing and being like, okay, uh, let's go talk to these LRTs and come up with these agreements, right? Um, so maybe I'll pause there. Does that make sense as to like why we're seeing AVS LRT agreements? Yep. Okay, great. Um, and then maybe just to double click into like what these agreements actually are. Um, and then I can turn it over to Brandon to maybe talk about like what are some issues we see with them um, and how they will likely evolve over time. So I think, again, what are like the fields of information on these agreements? It is, I want an amount committed to me, no more, no less, right? Because if you commit way more than the agreed upon amount, that dilutes the yield for everybody else. If I, if you commit less, then I don't get like the security that I want, right? Um, they want basically some minimum duration of, hey, if you bring in, if you give me 500 million, I don't want that 500 million to, you know, that's got to stay for at least six months, right? So I don't have to worry for at least six months or maybe it's a year, right? Um, they are interested in having control over which other AVSs that capital is allowed to be um, restaked to. And so let's say I get, you know, my 500 million, I know I have it locked in for 12 months. But if I have no control over that, let's say, you know, one of those or a couple operators opt into really risky, you know, poorly run AVSs. Uh, and all of a sudden, like 100 million of my 500 million is slashed, it's gone. And that's because, you know, the operator made a, made a bad choice. And so, like, especially early on, they're being a little bit wary to say, okay, before you opt into another AVS, like, we have final say. Um, and, and I think, you know, don't worry, we'll be a good counterparty. We'll let you opt in if assuming they're good AVSs, but, but that is something that is being talked about on these agreements right now. Um, and then, yeah, I think on the other side, they'll commit to like a percent of total supply that they're going to pay you with. Um, so let's say that's, you know, like 1% of total supply that we will, you know, compensate you guys with and there's lots of different forms this could take. Maybe it's an airdrop, you know, to your depositors. Maybe it's, you know, just some lump sum, right? Like paid at the end of this duration period that you can then figure out how you want to distribute it uh, to your depositors or not. Um, but those are generally like the fields that we're seeing. Um, so maybe we can talk about like what makes sense in there, what's here to stay, what maybe doesn't make sense. I'll, I'll just add one more thing to the state of the market uh, that Miles went over, and that's that uh, at the moment, at least, uh, in Eigenlayer, the slashing element of all of this, so the penalties for operator misbehavior uh, in validating these AVSs, uh, that's not live yet. And so there's definitely an additional trust element at the moment that needs to exist between uh, the AVSs and the set of operators that they're working with. And so it makes it even more attractive to go to LRTs that are that are managing these relationships with top operators. So you don't have to worry about some rogue operator going off and and wrecking the uh, quality of service of uh, whatever your ABS is providing, uh, because right now there's no uh, there's no way to really penalize them directly. Mm. So just to maybe like su sum this up for a second. So there's so there's AVSs. So there's these folks that are launching things and that they they usually need, they want like a, maybe a set of permission operators and they want a bunch of capital. Best way to do that is to go to the LRTs. 
And um, so the LRTs, my Easy, easiest way to do that is to go to the, the easiest way, the easy, yeah. the fastest way, I would yes. say the fastest way to do that is to go to the LRTs. And so behind the scenes there, uh, that's why I think you probably see a lot of, at least from some of the LRTs uh, who are maybe being kind of like quick with it, I'd say um, they are like announcing a lot of partnerships with AVSs. And so the, there's a bunch of money that is like off chain getting committed. Or I would say maybe it's like you see the the marketing announcement on Twitter, right? And what, what does that actually mean? It means that there is some, you know, uh, loosely enforceable like legal agreement or LOI of some kind that, you know, was negotiated, uh, you know, off chain, obviously, between the AVS and LRTs. Okay. And it's the LRT is saying, I will commit X amount, maybe $500 million of security to your AVS. And there's a specific, so, and then there's terms of the deal. There might be duration, uh, duration requirements. There might be um, amount of capital that they're talking about making this number up a hundred million. There might be what's the acceptable collateral. There might be control over whether the AVS can, uh, the state can be pooled with others. There's all these different, there's terms, right? There's terms of the deal. And that all happens in some off-chain SLA. Yes. And uh, I think that's mainly like a, just kind of a moment in time. Um, I think the closest thing that you could look at for like parallels, if you go to, you know, the Cosmos Hub governance forum and you see, you know, basically what Stride or Neutron, you know, proposed for terms. Um, mm -hmm. Or if you go, you know, way back to the Polkadot parachain days and you can go look at, okay, what were like the terms of, you know, the the Akala like, like uh, loan or something like that, right? Um, and those were early forms of this, uh, definitely had their, a, a lot of issues. Um, but at least like they were in kind of out in the open. Right. And I think right now, um, it was, you know, per, partially like a function of Eigenlayer just being like pre-launch, right. There is no sort of like, uh, central place where you can go and see like what these agreements are, where capital is. Um, but I think we will see that over time. Brandon, over to you to tell us. I mean, this sounds like good good deals, right? Someone needs something. Someone else is providing that thing. What is the problem uh, that we're seeing with these early agreements as you see it? Yeah, uh, so there are a couple challenges here. I think the first is that uh, these commitments are all in dollar terms, uh, and these LRTs have deposits in the ETH. Uh, so uh, there's no way to control the ETH price. There's no way to predict what it's going to be. Um, and there's also really no mechanism uh, if you have open deposits and withdrawals uh, to constrain your net in and outflows. And so if you make a commitment to supply at least $500 million worth of shared security to an AVS, uh, and you have no real way to, to, to credibly constrain uh, these flows so you can hit those numbers, uh, then it really does turn into this kind of this off this off chain handshake agreement. Uh, and so, you know, another challenge with this is definitely the duration element of it. If something happens with the market, uh, if there's you know another another Athena and the ETH wants to go somewhere else, uh, or if you know another LRT comes out that looks more desirable for whatever reason, uh, and you do have net outflows, uh, and you've made these you made these commitments without really consulting users in any way, uh, then there's really no saying that you're going to be able to, to hit these commitments. And then there's some questions about uh, what the ramifications of that will be uh, for these LRTs. Uh, and AVSs that have entered into these types of agreements. What's the actual downside of that, though? So users commit money to an LRT. LRT commits that money to an AVS. Uh, then maybe users say, uh, and the duration is, let's say, two years or whatever, and 500 million. Then the users actually say, hey, actually, LRT, I want to go to this other LRT that looks more exciting, or I want to go to somewhere else where there's better yield. Um, you, money flows out of the LRT. LRT can no longer commit that capital to the AVS. Okay, maybe what like what what's well, the problem? I, I, here's the the issue is in my opinion like the LRT is making a commitment to an AVS, but the capital that the LRT is committing is actually controlled by the users who mm. did not make that commitment. It'd be one thing if, you know, a user comes into an LRT protocol and says, "Hey, okay, here's my ETH." Mm -hmm. I will be, I'm happy to lock this up for two years, right? Uh, or I'm happy to lock it up for six months, 12 months, right? 
And then the LRT looks at their balance sheet, right, of deposits or in, in sure. say, okay. So, you know, 20% of our TVL is locked up for two years. Another, you know, 30% is locked up for a year. And then the rest set of users did not want any locking, right? Um, they wanted the ability to withdraw anytime. Okay, so that means I have basically, you know, 50% of my TVL I can make actual commitments to AVSs with because I know that the users have locked up that capital, right? Whereas today, according to the user agreements, everybody can withdraw at any point in time. Meaning like it, there's nothing stopping, you know, the TVL of an LRT from going to zero, right? If every single user decided to withdraw. Uh, okay, that, it, that that's fine. Like that's the product that they're selling, but now, you know, mm. the commitment that the LRT made to the AVS is just, you know, kind of gone, right? Or it's, I would say it's, it's, it's broadly like there's no way to actually enforce the terms of these agreements if it, that's one way to put it. What about the, um, well, well, there's, okay, there's this interesting component that's happening here where the LRT, how do you pick is what I'm getting. Uh, how do you, who picks at an LRT? Like, how does this actually work? So you, so AVS goes to like a bunch of LRTs and the LRT, is deciding that someone's legit or not legit based on, I don't know, so, something basically. Um, and you're now saying that I am, you're now basically uh, allocating users capital on be You're now basically allocating uh, capital on behalf of your users. You're almost like a hedge fund manager or a fiduciary now. I imagine there's like a, I imagine some users are going to get pissed, but B, there's actually some like weird regulatory ramifications probably here. Um, oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't. That's maybe like a difference from like how Cosmos exists, where like, every, well, yeah, what, yeah. How do you how do you think about this? Yeah, we can talk about it later. I mean, I I definitely think that LRTs like should be rebranded um, yeah. because they actually look more like you know yield vault strategies in a lot of ways mm. than they do what you like what an LST does under the hood. Um, mm. But yeah, no, I, I think I think the where something has got to give here is that you know if the capital that you're committing to AVSs needs to also have some commitments around it, right? Um, or you can say, hey, yeah, we are an LRT, we can't offer duration, you know, guarantees because we didn't build the protocol that way, um, and we don't want to because users don't really want to opt into these things. So that may maybe one way this all shakes out is like this duration stuff just kind of goes away because because it's not you know realistic or or the market doesn't want it. Another way it does shake out is again like the opt in has to come somewhere right, and the opt in from the user side should come before the commitments because I actually don't see a problem if I commit for two years and I am depositing into this LRT vault because I want yield right one additional yield and i'm happy to outsource like the management of that to, to experts right that's all fine and good um i just yeah th that's that's kind of the, the main issue we see with it is that it's not the users that are F the mm. users haven't opted in before the lrt opts in on their behalf yeah and and tarun uh gauntlet and others have commented on the sort of the unexpected nature of some of these duration elements in these agreements uh, because you know, I, I do kind of agree with Miles uh, that there was this this rush to brand uh, LRTs uh, with just to make the analogy with LSTs, uh, because the belief was that a lot of the dynamics would be pretty similar. Um, LSTs have a little bit of duration risk. It does take some time to get ETH in and out of the, the beacon chain, for instance, um, but not to the tune of like multiple weeks or months uh, of lockup. and. Uh, so I think that when a lot of these things were initially getting set up, uh, the thought was that uh, things might play out more like they did with the, the yield vaults uh, in DeFi, where those vaults uh, didn't go after things that really had a duration element. Uh, they went after things that had liquid incentives that they could liquidly you know, get capital in and out of. Uh, and it looks like it, potentially that things will shake out a little bit differently uh, in the LRT space. And so, you know, it's also possible that over time the market does restructure and we do move to just purely liquid incentives and no duration element and, and open operator sets. Uh, I think that'll be a lot more palatable on the AVS side of things once slashing is actually implemented. 
because they'll have uh, this additional degree of enforcement uh, that the operators that do come in will actually do the work that they signed up to do. Uh, but it, it'll probably take some time for that to play out. Uh, and m many of these agreements that are being signed now between LRTs and AVSs are happening before uh, these, these AVSs are even live. Uh, so in some cases, these LRTs are opting in and they haven't even uh, seen exactly what it is that they're committing to running, uh, let alone you know, talk with operators and, and verify that they're uh, okay with actually running this stuff. Yeah. Mm. What is the better model here, Brandon? Or models? Yeah, I think th there are definitely some some changes that you could make here um, to at least make these agreements uh, a little bit more sensible. Uh, the first is probably moving away from this dollar-based commitment structure. Uh, there's just no way to guarantee that that any amount of ETH is going to be worth any amount of dollars in the future. Um, so just moving to ETH-based commitments uh, or commitments that consider uh, maybe a fraction of the capital that's committed uh, to the LRT uh, would at least be uh, a little bit more enforceable. And uh, I think there's some some questions as well in the longer term uh, if you know potentially AVS has moved to a, a model uh, of of getting this additional restake security that maybe looks more like a lease uh, where they're maybe putting up some of their own token uh, as collateral and then basically paying back. Uh, that lease over time, uh, and if you know if they stop paying or they're unable to pay, then then potentially the LRT gets the, the, those tokens that were put up as collateral. Uh, there there are a couple different ideas that are uh, being worked on now uh, about what this market might look like as it becomes more mature. Uh, and and as Miles said, if there is going to be a duration element, and that does end up being an important uh, consideration for some AVS designs, then if users have some way uh, that they can opt in. Uh, to these durations, then then the LRT will be able to take a look at uh, the capital that it has and, and reason more about the duration of agreements that they can enter into. Yeah, right. And there there might be a um, it, it might work out very well where I think AVSs could and and should be willing to pay more to restate capital that has locked up the assets for the duration of like the agreement right versus what they pay to capital that can leave any time right and on the depositor side there may be you know this might find product market fit because maybe there is depositors that are fine locking up their eth for two years they're going to hold it for two years anyways and by actually locking it up they get directed a higher amount of of, of yield compared to the users that want to go take their lrt and use it in DeFi. Right. And so maybe like they're each LRT has as two types of users, you know, the ones that lock up the capital in the protocol and can't go use the asset in DeFi for any reason or something like that. And then users that they want something that looks a little bit more like an LST with like a little bit more extra yield. But the lion's share of like rewards would go to the ones that lock up their capital for for a long time. Right. Um, and that would be a good outcome. It's just, you know what we're missing today is sort of like that, you know, alignment of those commitments. Um, and I would say another thing, just even zooming out, like not even speaking to like the details of the, the agreements themselves, but you know, what we've been thinking about at, at Rio, um, where uh, Reverie, we worked very closely with the Rio team. We've been thinking about a governance process um, and what this looks like from the LRT side. Right. And so, even just like the details of the agreements being out in the open and the details of the evaluation of the AVSs um, being out in the open and having token holders of the LRT opt into these things, similar to the way that like Lido, when they add operators or when they add a new staking module, um, you know, like the DVT module, right? Everybody was able to vote on first approving that module and then a vote on proving how much of overall deposits are routed there. Um, and so first step would be just like getting this stuff out into the open so that we can all like see what the agreements are and where capital is committed to. And, um, you know, a couple dashboards around that would be nice too for like the rest of the, uh, the general public. Um, and then we can think about, okay, like what is here to stay? And then how do we design mechanisms that, kind of enforce these commitments or whatever we're actually agreeing to. 
um, then I'll be happy. Yeah, there's there's a legibility problem here that as a user, you want to come in and you want to believe that uh, some of this risk is is being managed. Uh, and so when you have all these commitments flying uh, and there's not a lot of transparency into what is really being agreed uh, and these things aren't even live yet, um, the, the perspective from some is that because slashing is off, that we should just play all the capital into everything and that there's not really a, a quality aspect um, that can be evaluated on, on the risk side. Basically, uh, there's no additional risk from opting into additional AVSs. And so why not kind of opt into all of them? Uh, that's that's going to be a short-term thing. I, I think slashing is going to be here sooner rather than later. Uh, and there'll be... Uh, another element here that needs to be managed if LRTs are, are going to be uh, managing risk in a way that actually helps users uh, to get the best uh, risk adjusted uh, rewards from engagement and restaking. Yeah. And just as like kind of riffing off of that, it will be interesting if you know, everybody opts into every single AVS pre slashing and then slashing comes and people realize, oh shit, these are like, this is pretty, these slashing conditions are scary. I actually, hey, can we go look at that like, agreement uh and and maybe tweak some things and so i will be interested to see you know if pre-slashing you know everybody delegates to everybody or everybody you know opts into every avs how how many people start opting out of avs is post slashing and how does that impact the downstream sort of like agreements and commitments that lrt's made to avs's yeah one thing i'm curious about is who has the leverage in the situation it seems like especially with no slashing, the AVSs have like a, a huge amount of leverage here. And I wonder if that plays into maybe there being some bad deals for the LRT side of things. I know when you look at sort of Cosmos and Neutron, people are sort of realizing for the operators over there that maybe it wasn't a good deal for them uh, given those terms. So is that something you're seeing where maybe LRTs are getting the bad end of the stick? So at least, um, at least in restaking, uh, there is the ability to opt out. So with um, some of the earlier models of shared security that we've seen in places like the Cosmos ecosystem, uh, they they sign this agreement and they're locked in. Um, so now, at least as the the risk profile uh, and sort of the risk reward ratio for these things changes over time, uh, because you know eventually we'll we'll get to see what usage looks like for these things, like what kind of users and what kind of fees they have. Uh, what the token's worth, what they're actually willing to pay, uh, and the market will will probably self-correct there. Um, but at least that's a you know a step up over a situation where your whole validator set is just opted in uh, and just has to kind of deal with it. Yeah, um, I think I would also look like make a distinction between uh, stakers and operators of like who's getting actually the the raw deal here. Um, and I and I won't speak for Brandon, but I I do feel like the constraints of operators are not being uh, thought through. Like they're they're probably getting the worst deal right now. Um, a lot of these AVSs are thinking about you know they want to airdrop basically the portion of supply as payment right to the LRTs, and they're you know there's a very realistic possibility that they just um, send those rewards directly or make them claimable to the addresses of the depositors, basically to bypass the actual operators, right? Um, and I think as we saw with the, you know, Cosmos Hub and ICS, um, the difference between really like what a staker is willing to opt into is very different than what an operator is willing to opt into who's maybe double or tripling their fixed costs, right? Their operating costs while only getting like a portion of that you know, what the yield would be from, let's say, an, a normal sovereign L1. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think more consideration to like the constraints, the operators will will start to, um, I think, probably self-correct over time as well. Yeah, I what would agree with that. I think that the, um, the operator constraints are going to end up being, you know, in, in many cases, more constraining than the uh the then the perspective of the capital uh in terms of what services you want to run because the capital may be happy getting a few basis points of uplift uh to opt into something uh because it's you know it's the same capital they're not being asked to go out and get another token and um be exposed to the price you know volatility of these new tokens they're just they just have their ETH in there and any additional yield is additional yield 
But from the perspective of the operators, uh, the fact that the capital is is being reused is perhaps less of a, a, a consideration for them. Uh, because from their perspective, they're they're adding new infrastructure that they have to set up, that they have to monitor, that they have to maintain. Uh, and they need to hit certain targets when, when they evaluate networks um, just for revenue uh, on the operator side. And so I think there's still a lot of open questions about what operator revenue will look like uh, in some of these networks. And a lot of these early agreements don't really take that into consideration. Um, but, but I agree with Miles that, that it'll probably work itself out over time as it becomes clear uh, who's actually willing to pay. All right, I mentioned them in the pre-roll. Now I'm going to bring them up again. It's Arbitrum. Santi and I are really fed up with these high fees and we're really excited to have teamed up with Arbitrum for the next couple of months on Empire. As the leading Ethereum scaling solution, Arbitrum now powers hundreds of decentralized apps across DeFi, perps, NFTs, gaming, and a whole lot more. The team has showed us everything in the ecosystem, both now and what's to come, and we're really, really excited about it. Arbitrum allows both daily users and developers to interact with Ethereum at scale with low fees and faster transactions. The way the team got me excited was through portal.arbitrum.io. So my call to action to you is to get started by visiting portal.arbitrum.io. Go experience on-chain like it was meant to be. This episode is brought to you by Monad. Monad's thesis is simple. The EVM is here to stay, similar to JavaScript and Web2, but unfortunately, today's EVM lacks the high performance and the scalability that developers need to make certain applications possible. Monad addresses these concerns and these bottlenecks while preserving seamless EVM composability for application developers. There's a seamless transition to Monad as the Ethereum RPC API allows for really easy portability. And for developers, Monad Monad can support 10,000 real transactions per second with their unique parallel execution environment. And of course, there's full compatibility with EVM bytecode. Monad's internal devnet is live. Public testnet comes out soon. You can join Monad's journey in two ways. One, go follow them. They're on Twitter at Monad, M-O-N-A-D underscore X-Y-Z. And also join the Monad Discord. It's discord.gg forward slash Monad. Big thanks to Monad for sponsoring Empire. Hey everyone, Santi and I have been talking about Solana a lot recently, and we're excited to have a Solana sponsor of Empire. Marinade is a staking protocol in Solana. I remember when they launched, I think it was back at the Solana Hackathon, and they were funded with this 80K grant. It's super cool to see how far they've come. They're the only stake pool today that delivers auto rebalancing, MEV rewards, and automatic downside protection with their new protected staking rewards. You can stake natively or liquid stake with Marinade and get the same high performance delegation strategy that thousands are using already to stake your soul to over a hundred of the best Solana validators. Marinade has been live for over two years and they have audits completed by four of the top security firms in crypto. The delegation strategy is a first of its kind. So if you're staking your Solana, if you wanna start staking your Solana, if you wanna get some yield from your soul, start staking today with Marinade, go hit the link in the show notes. Big thanks to Marinade for everything that they've done in Solana staking land. Go check them out, go stake your Solana with Marinade today. Hey everyone, Jason here. I know you've been hearing a lot about the intersection of crypto and AI, and that's why I'm really excited to share our newest partner and sponsored empire, Scale, a high performance modular blockchain that's revolutionizing gaming and AI. With zero fees and instant finality, Scale's unique architecture allows for massive scalability and has already saved users over 6 billion in gas fees. The five main takeaways that you need to know for Scale, one, zero gas fees, two, Scale has instant finality and lack of MEV. Three, the zero gas fee model of scale is really important for blockchain gaming adoption as gamers don't have to pay transaction costs or have the SKL token. Four, scale is multi-chain. This design allows for nodes to be combined to create chains and for individual subnodes to actually be removed and relocated, which creates greater security and collusion resistance. And five, scale has become a really good fit for AI dApps because they're fast, automated, zero fee transactions. Big thank you to Scale for sponsoring Empire. We're excited to partner with you guys. Bridge over to Scale if you're listening to this at scale.space forward slash ecosystem. Follow the journey along with Scale on X at Scale Network. That's at Scale Network. Big thanks again to Scale for sponsoring Empire. Guys, as we round out the AVS conversation, because I do want to get into the kind of next part of this convo, 
How do you, um, if you are an AVS, if you're a founder building something, how do you decide if you should leverage security from one of these LRTs or from Eigenlayer or whatever you want to call it versus just doing it on your own? What's the decision-making rationale that goes in there? So I'd say um, you mean if I'm, I want to launch a chain and the decision around, should I launch this through Eigenlayer or should I launch just my own sovereign? Basically, Exactly. Like yeah, I think that's, that's um, so I would say it is like you're going to spend a lower portion of your overall supply on security if it's being if you're being secured by you know restakers who are not having to go out and buy your token and lock it up right they already have eth locked up they already own eth and so you know the opportunity cost of capital is really really low um and one way just to benchmark this like i think osmosis it's they've cut it down quite a bit but osmosis originally was supposed to spend about 20 percent of its total supply on uh, basically compensating stakers and the operators, right? Uh, the numbers we're being seen thrown around here are like in the single di- low single digits of supply, right? And and it's getting a lot of people to opt in. Um, I will say the second piece of this is this really hazy hand wavy turn like a term of alignment. Um, mm. You know, I think the only way to really tap into the Ethereum user base and liquidity um, previous to Eigenlayer was to become a rollup or just launch as a smart contract application, right? Or like you are completely on your own, right? You're out, you're building a completely new brand and really having to basically start from scratch of like building a user base and, you know, attracting mindshare, getting brand awareness out there, right? There is this component, this dynamic here of like, okay, if I launch as an eigenlayer, you know, uh, AVS instead of a sovereign L1, not only do I get those cost savings, I also basically get, you know, something that's closer to this level of, you know, alignment of like a roll up or, you know, a, a regular smart contract dab, right? I'm going to airdrop a bunch of users, you know, my token from Ethereum, and they're going to look at me differently as like an AVS than they do as, you know, a standalone L1. Um, And so, yeah, I think there is definitely a a growth hack like component here where you can kind of break that trade off of getting, not having the constraints of a roll up, getting like what everything you want as an L1, while not at the same time, just kind of being left to your own, you know, means in terms of building brand awareness and attracting, you know, users and liquidity, right? I don't know, Brandon, anything you want to add there? Yeah, uh, three things, actually. Uh, so the first is just around decentralization. Uh, if you launch a new network, you raise from investors, you do some airdrops, um, you're still going to end up with a pretty uh, a pretty poor distribution of tokens. And you can see this like on a lot of new Cosmos chains where the top couple validators are you know, usually investors and maybe they're 20% of the network each. Um, whereas if you go and you're tapping into the, the ETH supply, uh, it's already so distributed at this point, uh, that even if you're onboarding just a subset of the the total operators that are involved in restaking, you can start out in a much more decentralized place than you can, uh, if you're just working with the tokens, uh, that you've, that you've done natively, uh, for a native chain. Uh, the, the second thing is, uh, you might not actually have to make, uh, the choice in a really binary fashion, uh, in the future. So there's this concept of dual staking, uh, which is where you are tapped into the shared security um, of you know, restaked ETH, uh, but then you might have another set of operators that are staking, uh, or at least are delegated your native token. And so uh, you can kind of get the best of both worlds there potentially, where you have this capital that you can bring in that's potentially a lot cheaper and more distributed, uh, but then also involve your, uh, your native token as well. Uh, and then you have to have basically both sets of those validators sign off on things uh, in order for them to go through uh, in your ABS. Uh, and then the third thing is just around uh, this concept of attributable security, which is something that folks at, at Eigenlayer have talked about quite a bit. Uh, so th- there are certain sorts of AVSs uh, that you might build that might uh, really benefit from the ability to reason uh, about the amount of restake security they have relative to the economic flows 
within the AVS. So uh, probably the simplest example of this would be something like a bridge where you're bridging, let's say ETH and BTC and, and USD uh, to different chains. Uh, the ability to actually lock in uh, at least the amount of uh, capital on the restake side as you have sort of actively flowing through your system, uh, you might be able to, to, to reason more readily about the security uh, that you actually have on the AVS side. And these are all things that are really, really hard to do, if not impossible, if you just launch your own chain and secure uh, it only with your native token. Nice. All right, let's get into the next part of this conversation, which is LRTs versus LSTs. I, I've seen a lot of people on Twitter and just in podcasts kind of comparing LRTs to LSTs because the name is similar. And I think, Miles, when we've spoken, I, you know, my understanding is, Brandon, we, we haven't talked about this yet, but um, Miles, when we've spoken, uh, it's clear that your your view of how this market develops is going to be very different than how the LST market develops. So I'd love to, um, yeah, I'd love to get your high level thoughts here, and then we can dive into the details. Yeah, sure. I think it starts by just like looking at uh, LSTs and LRTs of like what they are and what they do, and then from there you can draw some like implications around you know what end state market structure looks like, or and specifically. You know, does end state market structure of LSTs, which we already know is basically winner take most slash winner take all, does that actually map over to, to LRTs? Um, and so maybe I can just run through like the differences first and then give you the high, you know, high level conclusions. I think, um, well, first of all, like LSTs are extremely homogenous in what they do, right? You basically deposit tokens and they all are different ways of doing the same job, which is validating one network, right? Um, two, I think they don't really compete on yield, right? Um, if they did compete on yield, then Lido would not have this, you know, dominant market share lead, right? It's not like Lido is winning because it's double or triple the yield of the other LSTs. Uh, they're really competing, I think, basically to achieve parity with ETH in terms of, you know, internet moneyness, whatever we want to call that, right? Um, and so they compete uh, in terms of, you know, liquidity, integrations, and they're basically, you know, the goal of Steeth, like the stated goal of Steeth is it to be as ubiquitous as ETH itself, right? And I do think that, you know, as um, more activity goes up the stack to L2s and, now native ETH, you know, on L2s is not, it, it is a derivative itself. It's a bridged, you know, derivative token, right? Um, I think the, I'd say like the relative value prop of LSTs is even stronger because it's like, you're not, you know, if it's bridged anyways, why don't you earn some staking yield on it, right? Um, and so I do think like LSTs in general are basically trying to, I would say like replace ETH, but compete with ETH directly. Uh, now LRTs, I think a better way to describe them is like restaked index tokens, uh, rather than LSTs because they are so different than LSTs and what they do, right? It's not just you're depositing in to secure Ethereum. It's basically you're giving them, uh, you're depositing in assets and then telling them to go manage, you know, yield strategies for you. It's more like. It's more like a strategy, like a strategy vault token, um, or it's more like a mutual fund, right? And the reason I think that um, you know these things are going to look very different is because there are so many different ways to design an LRT um, in terms of you know how much risks do you take on with the AVSs that you select? Uh, what do you do with the rewards, right? If these are all native token rewards. Are you just holding all of those on your balance sheet so that this thing is actually not just like ETH anymore and over time becomes less and less ETH and more and more of a mix, right? Now that starts to look more like, like an index or like a hedge fund, right? Um, and then, you know, I think even on the user preference side, people are going to have very different uh, preferences in terms of yield. Uh, let's think of like duration becomes a thing, right? Maybe you now have like long-term LRTs, right? And I think that the more and more that like an LRT tries to uh, appeal to everybody, like tries to take as many types of collateral as possible, all the LSTs as possible, native ETH as possible, and native ETH, right? 
um, tries to come up with one strategy that satisfies basically all types of users, like it kind of falls into no man's land and they end up not being really good at, at either one. Um, and so I think over time, what we'll see with the LRTs is you'll have, you know, uh, maybe winners at the entity level, uh, but they'll have families of, of LRT products underneath that. Um, no, we haven't even started talking about like, you know, USD restaking, right. Um, or all the other sorts of our, our BTC, right. Or Solana, right. So there's, I could see winners kind of like Fidelity and BlackRock are winners, you know, at the entity level of, you know, the mutual fund industry, but they have a family of funds, um, that sort of do a better job of appealing to the different sort of preferences of their own demand side and really the preferences of what, you know, the AVSs they're depositing into, right? Because there may be some AVSs that don't really care about the duration stuff and that's great. Okay. So now they can, we can tap into those from this LRT family. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I think over time we will start to see that like, it's going to be very challenging to create you know, under the umbrella of one LRT token, a product that appeals to everybody. Um, and so I think, you know, getting ahead of that could be the smarter thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like LRTs are, um, uh, LRTs are like mutual funds in a sense where you can pick your, kind of pick your poison, pick your strategy. And then um, uh, you could, oh, this might be extending the analogy too far, but you could say that um, LSTs, like Steeth is trying is basically just um like a U.S. Treasury market fund, mm. which is basically mm. a U.S. dollar, um like U.S. dollar with a little bit of yield on top. LRTs are more like mutual funds. Is that yeah? How, how's yeah. Your it's like um, I forget what I was trying to. I think it was like basically you know like corporate or sovereign debt that's you know collateralized with treasuries, and you get the yield on both. Right, like that's what it kind of starts to look like. Um, but yeah, there's no, I, I think these like analogies are, are somewhat helpful, but you have to recognize like there's actually no perfect analogy here. Um, you know, defaulting on like debt is very different than a slashing event. Um, and so mm. you have to, you have to view those differently. Right. Um, and maybe you can be a little bit more, you know, risk on with something like an LRT than you could as, you know, a fixed income fund at Fidelity or something like that, because the worst case scenario, you don't lose all of that, like all of that money. You just maybe lose a portion of it. But um, yeah, Brandon, you and I have been thinking about kind of like the future of of the LRTs and, and different products to make. And and we see a lot of, you know, whether it's duration or multiple types of, you know, restaking assets, like these are all kind of like coming and curious to hear if you'd push back on any of that. Yeah. I mean, you hit a lot of the differences and just the, the, the ways these things can be assembled. Just what sorts of things you opt into, what your general risk tolerance is, um, this, even the, you know, the strategy capacity of different AVSs. Not every AVS is going to need billions of dollars in security. Um, other considerations like LRTs of, of other assets, uh, which we could, we could totally see in the future here. Um, the reward management strategies, duration. Um, so a lot of these things are why we set Rio up. Uh, to be a protocol that can issue potentially uh, a number of LRTs. I think it's a, a bit early. I don't think we know quite enough about the market structure yet uh, to say which of these categories will be the most interesting. Uh, but my expectation is that there will be a broader uh, range of LRTs that are still interesting to users and still have a place in the market than in LSTs where it has been winner take most. Uh, because we could see a number of LRTs that, that stay relatively small and go after um, some of these opportunities that maybe need less capital or have more constraints on participation. Uh, th there's this concept that uh, Eigenlayer has talked about uh, quite extensively of uh, these, these attributes, these validator attributes, uh, where you're basically trying to take into account um, other aspects of the operators that are engaged in your protocol that go beyond just how much capital they have. Um, and maybe that you know, looks at things like geographical decentralization things like that. Uh, and so there could be AVSs that are constructed uh, that have more constraints on, on what kind of involvement they want uh, from operators. Uh, and, and that could also just lead to a number of LRTs that, that engage with those strategies 
um, uh, that the the larger LRTs may choose to forgo. Westy, uh, I think your piece. When did you wrote? I think you wrote this eigenlayer piece on restaking back in like fall of 2022 um, on Blockworks Research. What, like, what are your thoughts on just having seen the on how the LRT market will develop um, in like in comparison to how the LST market developed? I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, I was definitely super early in running about eigenlayer. I remember when it first came across my desk, it was like this academic project almost. And they like a lot of the things they were talking about at the time were more like cryptographic solutions versus what we're seeing now where, where like we're talking about where you can actually restake and have a, like a sovereign L1 uh, under that control. So it's really cool to see how it's developed over time. But yeah, I really don't have much to add to what Miles said. I agree completely that the way this is playing out is much different than the LST market where we sort of saw, like you said, LSTs are more homogenous. So over time, it sort of converged to where uh, the most liquidity was. So we're seeing Lido and Steeth capture significant market share versus other players. And what's really interesting to see, because LRTs, like you said, are more fragmented or will become more fragmented, we started to see a lot of the longer tail LSTs actually start to pivot and focus towards LRTs, Swell being one, an example of that. Uh, but yeah, over time, I think it's going to be super interesting to watch the different strategies play out. And I wonder, like as we talked about earlier, these agreements between AVSs and LRTs, if we start to see cartelization between those two. Um, so if like mm. big uh, LRTs partner with big AVSs, and that's sort of like uh, one center and Maybe there's a bunch of these. And so you might see market dynamics where it's top heavy. Maybe there's not one winner, but there's three maybe winners of these cartels over time. But it's definitely going to be more fragmented. And I'm interested to see going forward how we sort of categorize the riskiness of the different LRTs. If maybe we start to like see maybe like tranches of products, almost like CBOs in traditional finance that package together like different risks along the spectrum. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of cool things that can play out, but that's sort of how I'm thinking about it. Brandon, how do you think about this at Rio? I mean, there's like, maybe we can double click on the varying degrees of riskiness that Westy was saying. So the most extreme version of an LRT is one that accepts a bunch of, like, correct me if I get this wrong, is one that accepts a bunch of LSTs, I think is collateral probably. And then maybe like a safer version would be if you only accept like ETH as the collateral or something like that. And then there's everything in between. Um, so A, correct me if that's wrong, but B, like the if, you, if you're riskier, you're actually going to probably do better in this market, but you're, a lot of those folks are going to end up blowing up in the bear market. Um, and when some of that stuff starts to unwind. So like, yeah, how do you think about this as it relates to the, the Rio strategy? Yeah. Um, so at Rio, we, we took a look at sort of LSTs versus native ETH. Uh, there's a bunch of factors that play into that. There is this risk profile. Uh, if you have your own operators uh, doing the native staking versus uh, having whatever operator set is running the LSTs uh, do that portion of it. Um, obviously, a, an LRT that's doing native staking has access to those uh, native staking rewards flows as well. Um, whereas if you have an LST, it might be more difficult to, to try to take an additional fee uh, on those flows because the LST operators are already doing that. Um, and then, you know, just from a risk management perspective, I, I think we saw this really play out uh, in the yield aggregator world uh, in, in the last couple of years in DeFi, where there were some yield aggregators that kept things pretty, pretty simple, pretty straightforward, um, and only really went after these blue chip opportunities. Uh, some of those yield aggregators are still around. Uh, we saw others that tried to differentiate themselves by just going way out on the risk curve and going after stranger assets and stranger places. Uh, and a, lo a lot of those ended up blowing themselves up. Uh, and I think that the, the, the fact that there's an infrastructure element uh, to opting into an AVS as well uh, potentially puts additional constraints on this because you know, every time you add an additional AVS at the LRT level, you're committed to running and maintaining and managing this additional infrastructure. Um, whereas, you know, if you have a, a, a multi-strategy DeFi vault, uh, the only infrastructure that you have 
uh, involved is, is just the on-chain transactions you need to do to carry out that strategy. So um, we're definitely going to take a more, a more blue chip uh, approach to things with this initial product uh, with ReEth. Uh, and we'll sort of see how the market plays out over time and if there are other uh, opportunities that are interesting, whether those involve additional assets or, or going further out on the risk curve. Uh, but I think the place to be right now is sticking more blue chip. Yeah. What do you guys think of, I don't know if this is a, Brandon, I'm sure you don't want to talk negatively about any competitors. So maybe it's more of a question for Miles, or I don't know who it's a question for, but like, you know, EtherFi has come out of the gate swinging. They have three and a half billion TVL, depending on how you want to, obviously count tvl but like if you're just going off DeFi llama like three and a half billion ether five renzo's just past three billion puffer is over a billion kelp is at 750 swell is at 350 and there's a you know longer list of like sub 100 million what do you think are the so obviously that's impressive um what is the kind of downside of maybe what some of these other folks uh the, the strategy that some of them have taken i'm not sure if it's like a, a downside to call out necessarily yet um i also don't think we there's not enough information on the differences between these lrts that that really matter i think yet in terms of their design and and maybe like what they're committing to and you know i'll, I'll say like <laughs> when you go under the hood there's a lot of different ways to like set up an lrt um there's not to get like too technical but you could have you know a separate eigen pod for every single set of 32 ETH and then end up with tens of tens of thousands of eigen pods. Or you could, you know, basically direct all of your ETH towards one eigen pod. And the benefits of the former is that you can provision out capital very flexibly. The downside of the former when you have pods, thousands and thousands of pods is that it's a, it's a huge amount of gas cost basically just to run your operations, right? Whereas, but if you put everything into one pod, then you can't actually provision out capital very flexibly. Um, so those are things under the hood that will take a while for us to see actually what were the right design decisions and what were the bad design decisions. Um, and then I think, yeah, to, to a lot of earlier points, it's, I'm seeing a problem where if you like design a protocol to try to cater, you know, as much as possible to the supply side, where you accept all these different types of collateral, you say you can withdraw anytime, right? It's very hard to then satisfy like the AVS side, which might say, we only want this kind of collateral. We want basically duration requirements, right? Um, and so I do think it's 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 kind of impossible to set up one design that satisfies, you know, both sets of the market. Um, now, if you could cut this up in another way, you might have, you know, one product that's longer duration and that satisfies like the AVSs that want that. And then, you know, different sorts of, uh, you know, cuts and variations underneath that. But um, yeah, I think until slashing comes out and until payments come out and, you know, we also start to see like what the, um, I guess the operational burden is of, of some of the, just the general sort of, you know, under the hood stuff that Eigenlayer does, whether that's just reward sweeping or, you know, proofs of the generating these proofs of your beacon state uh beacon chain state and improving it to the eigenlayer contracts that's like it's pretty expensive um yeah i think a lot of like eigenlayers um challenges are around the fact that it is built directly on eth l1 um and and a lot of you know gas actually does eat into yield quite a bit and so it may be the you know we may see that like simple design choices of of operations also could end up with like single or double digit yield differences, right? Um, just because of the drag on costs. And so, yeah, there's a lot more to a lot more to come, but until slashing is even out there, then I think you can, yeah. you don't take these things like, like I think they're reversible and, you know, um, there it's a lot of marketing, but yeah. that's okay. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just say that our, our philosophy at Rio, I mean, you can see how emergent the market is right now. You can see how many open questions there still are. Uh, about the unit economics of all these AVSs, about how operators are going to get paid, about what it's going to cost to run all this infrastructure, and you know even how operators are, are going to be compensated, um, these duration requirements, uh, you know even just, just things about AVS quality, um, and so we have have just made this decision to take our time, 
uh, and let this market develop a little bit before before rushing in. Uh, and what that means is that we don't have billions of dollars worth of capital that we have that we're forced uh, to go deploy into whatever opportunities present themselves. Uh, and so I think that this approach will will pay off as we're able to uh, collect more information uh, about what the market will look like over the medium term uh, and and act accordingly. Yeah, and le- the last thing I'll say is I think there's kind of two types of capital out there that's touching the restaking market. There's the mercenary farming capital. There's look, not thinking about you know an, an additional maybe three to five percent on my on my native staking yield. It's the capital that's looking for you know basically points farming and airdrops. And then once they get it, they're going to migrate to the next you know highest yield generating opportunity. And then there's the capital that is you know the non-farming bags, right? The long-term holdings that does genuinely find like, uh, you know, um, some some additional like ETH denominated yield on their ETH holdings really interesting and something that they'd be willing to hold and, you know, deposit for, for years, right? And so I think it's kind of uh, unclear right now just, you know, how much of current TVL is in that long-term sort of, or like long-term capital versus mercenary capital. And I think that, you know, everybody's kind of gunning for that long-term capital because they know that, you know, the mercenary capital is kind of a vanity metric right now and, and will likely run to, you know, Karak or whatever the next sort of um, big airdrop could be. Maybe the last dynamic that we could unpack here is uh, native staking versus external staking. So, so far it's all been external staking, right? And I'm curious... As, as this market develops, um, we'll probably start to see more like native restaking come into the market. And um, yeah, yeah, I'd be curious how you guys think that this will happen or yeah, well, I mean, maybe we could unpack this a little bit. Miles. Yeah, it's probably worth, I guess, defining what those two yeah, yeah. are because this is something Brandon introduced to me a while ago and, and I don't think it's really kind of gotten out into the the sphere of conscious quite yet. Um, but uh, I'll I'll give it a shot, and then Brandon, you can come in and and tear me apart and correct me and and do it the right way. But what the the entire restaking market right now, the, all AVSs, we consider these like external restaking use cases or the category of external restaking, meaning you have an external network, um, completely separate from Ethereum, right? That is secured by Ethereum operators um, and security. So you're exporting. Ethereum security and operators to secure new networks, right? Uh, now there's another category of restaking that I doesn't really get talked about it that much, which is, well, what if you could basically have uh, pay Ethereum proposers to make additional commitments around the way that the, the blocks that they build, the blocks that they propose, right? Um, in, you know, at, at the risk of of, re, uh, of slashing if they don't uphold those commitments. So maybe this is a builder paying, you know, a proposer to say, hey, next time you propose a block, you like are committing now to taking the block that I give you, right? I'm going to pay you this much now. And you can, if you don't do that, then we're going to slash you out of protocol. Like we're going to, uh, same way you'd get slashed on regular uh, eigenlayer, right? Or maybe it's, it's an L2 ecosystem saying, hey, uh, we'll pay you guys to for the guarantee that you'll include our pre-comps, right? So that we get like faster sort of finality. Um, and the way I see the, the big like, so what about this is, well, first of all, these sort of block, um, you know, building commitments are only really useful once you have a significant portion of the proposer set uh that has opted in right like if i'm an l2 and i want my you know guarantees on my pre-comps getting included it doesn't really help me if only like one out of ten proposers right are are actually going to do that um and so these things get really useful once you have a large percentage of the proposer set opted in um but that means there's probably only going to be a few use cases where this thing is you know this is such a no-brainer that the entire the majority of the validator set is going to opt in. Um, and think about like MEV boost, right? That was a no brainer for everybody. Um, 
now builders get to make more money, right? Because there's actually a way, like an auction sort of function around here, right? And proposers get paid in the form of revenue share. Um, and I think that's what this ends up looking like longer term, where you know it's it's a much more unconstrained market um, than external restaking because it's not cost on one side going to be you know revenue to proposers. It's like things there you are now making someone's making more money than they did beforehand because proposers are committing to whatever you know the use case is and you're sharing some of that revenue with the proposer itself um and so the, you know these this will only be kind of feasible once you know you have a large percentage of the proposer set opted in so there might only be like you know five things that proposers that are no-brainer enough that we actually might see this at some point um but I think the point here is that it's, it's it's a lot easier to reason about, right? It's not like you're just going to do this every single block, probably. Uh, you're not going to have to evaluate, you know, the slashing risks, uh, like across thousands of different AVSs. You're just going to say, okay, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, everybody's kind of agreed to do this. This is just another sort of check on the block I built. Um, and so, yeah, I think we won't see this for for quite a while until like there's a significant portion of you know uh proposers that have opted into any sort of restaking um but when we do i think it could be a very large category and so i'll stop there and then brandon uh please correct me yeah i i think the easiest way to think about these two categories is that there are some avs's that are that are just using this restake capital uh as just just cheap capital to secure whatever it is that they're doing uh they're not uniquely facilitated by uh, restaking really, because they're not really making use of access to the Ethereum state or Ethereum consensus uh, in, in any major way. Uh, and so those sorts of things might have uh, potentially less demand for capital. I, you know, I mentioned um, the sort of AVS um, strategy capacity consideration when we were talking a little earlier about how you might construct different LRTs. Um, Whereas where this other, uh, this native category that Miles was talking about uh, does actually make use of the fact that there are Ethereum block proposers that are participating in this sort of thing. And so, uh, yeah, they could make additional commitments uh, and that could potentially give you access uh, to some pretty huge revenue streams that already exist like MEV, um, like longer term leases on block space, um, those sorts of things, and and could potentially allow you to do experiments uh, that involve more fundamental changes uh, to how Ethereum functions. Um, so, you know, one that I've heard bouncing around is uh, an exploration of restaking uh, to do single slot finality on Ethereum. Uh, there's some architectural decisions that were you know made a made a long time ago in Ethereum uh, that make it really hard to get. Uh, to any sort of single slot finality solution, um, but without radically uh, changing how um, the network works. Uh, but if you were able to get a significant portion of um, uh, proposers opted into some sort of AVS, uh, you might be able to get there uh, without making changes directly to Ethereum. So I think these things are a ways off. Uh, I think these things do come potentially with um, some enhanced risk uh to the host network uh that will need to be thought through but these are potentially interesting because they are plugged into such large revenue flows uh and they would have essentially unlimited capacity uh from the perspective of uh, an lrt looking to deploy capital because they work better as more capital comes in and it's not that they're just trying to hit some security amount uh that they're willing to pay for uh, like some of these non-native applications yeah, and I think that you touched on like the most interesting part of this to me, um, which is I think let's imagine there's something that's not built into Ethereum, but 100% of proposers have agreed to follow these this additional set of rules. At that point, it's kind of effectively the same. You're getting the same thing as enshrining, you know, whatever this is into Ethereum itself. Uh, if the people, you know, every single actor that's building blocks for Ethereum is now following this additional set of rules, and in addition to, you know, the the base Ethereum set of rules, right? And so it's almost a way for 
um, you know, if we if you could get this much of the proposer set to opt in, almost fix things out of protocol, right? Instead of having to make some really scary base layer changes that you know, as we know, are happen extremely slowly and and very rarely, and you know, especially the, when they come with significant trade offs, right? Um, but that is you know very different way of looking at this thing, and and I think. If you remember when Eigenlayer first started coming out, I think, you know, the Ethereum core devs and the, you know, the EF looked at this thing as potentially really scary, right? Don't overload Ethereum consensus. But what if there's another angle here where it's actually, oh, this is actually a way for us to maybe like improve Ethereum without having to make some some base layer changes that, that come with trade-offs we don't really like. Or maybe it's just a canary network of sorts, right? We can try things out you know, with restaking before making that decision to to build it into the protocol. Anything else on the liquid staking versus, uh, excuse me, with native staking versus external staking, Miles, that you want to cover here? I have some other questions, but I don't know if there's anything else that we should cover. No, that that's it, really it. I think it's, yeah, go for it, Brandon. Yeah, I would just say that it's not, you know, breaking out these two categories isn't, isn't a value judgment against these external applications either. Um, because there's, you know, I, I think all the existing AVSs fit in this category. Um, and there's still some, you know, really exciting examples of, you know, like ethos taking a whole bunch of restaked ETH and then reselling that security across the Cosmos ecosystem. I think you can build applications that still require uh, huge amounts of, of, of restaked assets uh, and they could still tap into some pretty significant revenue flows. Um, but I'm just... Uh, Thinking about some of these more uh, native sort of consensus linked things, because I just I have a feeling that this is going to come up uh, in restaking at, at some point in the future. Guys, there's a couple other things as we think about wrapping this up that I just want to get your take on. One is um, I'd love to just get your take on the the other eigenlayer competitors that are are launching and are about to launch. So I think the first big one that launched was Karak or Karak or however you pronounce it, um, and obviously the you saw some like pretty public eigenlayer kind of pushback that obviously, you know, was the banter on Twitter. And, um, you know, I think there's this, the stealth project that's now become pretty public, um, but that hasn't launched yet. So I'm not sure if I should say something, but, um, yeah, there's a couple other like eigenlayer competitors coming to market built by some really, really, really strong teams. Um, and there's, you know, the new one coming to market is built by the strong team from the liquid staking, uh, space as well. So just be curious um, what, what you guys think of these competitors coming to market. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say to start things off that this was inevitable. Um, anytime you see something get as much hype um, and drive as much development as Eigenlayer has, there is, of course, going to be competitors. Uh, and, and some of those will just be across other networks. So, you know, there's uh, some folks working on restaking the Solana ecosystem. And there's a number of Cosmos projects now that are slightly rebranding to add restaking elements. Uh, but then, you know, we'll also see uh, restaking competitors on Ethereum. And I, I think that's totally expected. And I think it's probably a good thing as well. Um, just as there's a lot of different ways to implement an LRT, I suspect that uh, there are probably a number of ways to implement uh, just a restaking protocol. And so it'll be interesting to see um, as these other teams uh, take a look at the design space and and some of the trade-offs uh, that you have to make and just some of the jobs to be done um, from the perspective of AVSs and LRTs and operators, um, what they come up with. Uh, and I think any innovation in that area will just help us uh, feel out the whole design space uh, and figure out what we can do better uh, in order to make restaking work really well. Yeah, I would echo everything Brandon said. Um... Again, I'd highlight the distinction between uh, eigenlayer competitors on Ethereum, and then this idea that you know every big L1 will have its own you know native restaking provider, or probably multiple. Right? If they're successful, then you'll have more competition. We see this with Babylon, you know, coming going after Bitcoin, right? Um, and as Brandon mentioned, we're seeing you know already projects on Solana. We'll probably see them on Celestia. And there's something to be said for, okay, if you are, you know, the native sort of, you know, um, uh, restaking protocol on, on a new, on that L1, then you probably know the use cases that are going to be, you know, 
have the most demand on on that L1 and are going to know the L1 well enough to kind of design the protocol in the best way possible for, say, like restaking on Solana or restaking on Bitcoin. And you'll probably be able to do that better than, you know, I'd say even an eigenlayer, right? That's pulling in bridged assets from somewhere else and and trying to consolidate them in one place. Um, so I think the question is, you know, is there a kind of like a winner per L1 or like a winner per network? Or is there going to be one provider that's able to aggregate, you know, multiple L1 base layer assets into one place and still do it really well? Um, I think I lean probably towards there being specialized winners, you know, across different L1s. And then it's a question of, okay, how much bigger is the ETH, you know, restaking market than say Celestia versus Solana versus Bitcoin. Um, and yeah, I think on the demand side, then there's a question of, is there a world where it makes sense to get security from multiple, you know, providers at the same time? Or from multiple L1s, right? It's like if you, if we, because we kind of saw like getting operators in stake, you can do that anywhere, right? Um, there is a, this sort of growth and alignment angle, right? To to why these projects are choosing to to launch on Eigenlayer. Um, do you sort of dilute that as you add, you know, more L1s, right? And say like, well, I'm aligned with Bitcoin, Solana, Celestia, Andy. Well. Are you really aligned with anybody then? Or are you really actually getting the most bang for your buck like from that growth standpoint? My guess is probably not. Um, and so th that's kind of where I shake out. I think there will probably be like uh, one or more winners, you know, per major L1 kind of ecosystem. And then I don't really see a, a world where a lot of protocols are say, you know, drawing security from four different L1s and they're like this omni crypto sort of, you know, omni chain sort of ABS that, that just, I don't know, it feels complicated and dilutive to the growth aspect of it. Yeah. I'll, I'll just add that. I think that one of Eigenlayer's strengths and uh, how they've designed the restaking protocols and it's very unopinionated. Uh, we, we talked about some of the questions that an AVS or an LRT needs to answer uh, in order to get to market. So things about like, you know, how much security you need, what operators you need, um, how, what uh, other AVSs you're willing to have um, sharing some of the same capital that's securing your thing. Um, Eigenlayer as a protocol doesn't really have an opinion on any of these things or, or on who gets to make those decisions. Uh, and so I think the market will, will sort through that. Uh, if there are other protocols that come to market that take a more opinionated approach, that might work uh, better or worse for certain applications, certain sorts of AVSs. Uh, and so, yeah, I think it's a big design space and it'll be interesting to see uh, how it all gets mapped out. Yep. Totally agree. Cool. Uh, there was an Anatoly tweet the other day. He said, uh, Eigenlayer, but instead of stake, it's reputation-based. Uh, reputation is one of those things that anyone can build regardless of how much wealth they started with. I'd love to see someone formalize it and build it on Solana because there's a deep bench of small Solana validators. So there are these like other ideas emerge. There's like um, staking things, other things like reputation. There's also this idea that I've been thinking about, like, can you stake for other things? Like, can you stake to get access, maybe stake for three months to get access to a whitelist or something like, so there's these other like, you know, V2s and variations of staking that I'd just be curious to get um, your guys' take. I don't know if you've been thinking about that much, but. Would love to open it up yeah. to ideas. Re Reputation's a tricky one. Um, we've seen, you know, a lot of discussions over the years of things that we're going to use reputation to significantly reduce costs, um, and it's hard. Uh, I, I think there will definitely be innovation in the direction of, you know, like more quantitative metrics for gaining access to things. Um, that's the kind of reputation that I could probably get behind and, and see working. Um, so, you know, you, we see some experiments with this and the LSTs on Solana, where you have a lot of LSTs instead of, you know, going through the list of thousands of, of participants and trying to figure out who you trust, uh, you just measure and, and then manage your set accordingly. Um, and I could definitely see that here as, uh, you know, some of these AVS launches are starting out quite permissioned and, and maybe that's how they start to open things up. Uh, once operators actually have a track record. Uh, validating these things, you could start to incorporate that track record uh, in deciding who to let in. Uh, but in terms of a system that uh, 
doesn't involve any capital at all and is just reputation based. Um, well, I don't know. We've seen a lot of proof of authority systems. I was going to say, um, we, we, that, that already exists, I think. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, if you want to build a, a wormhole or something like that, then then you absolutely can. Um, but I don't know if that's really comparable to what we're trying to do with restaking. Right, right. I, I would just say, like, I think reputation, staking of reputation is, like, let's look at even Lido, right? The operators in Lido, they don't have any capital staked, right? It, it's purely the user's capital that is being staked through Lido. And so if an operator does something wrong, like what are they actually, what's at risk? Like their reputation, right? They get, okay, booted out of the Lido set. Lido makes a big deal out of saying, we don't deal with these like subpar operators. And now everybody looks at this operator as, you know, subpar or like with a big black mark. And that's going to actually decrease, you know, their future cash flows because it's going to decrease their ability to win new business. Um, now I'll need to look at exactly like what, Anatoly is talking about here. Um, but I think what the other thing you mentioned is just like restaking to things that have no slashing, right? For, you know, one reason or the other. Um, and I, again, think that's already happening a little bit with Eigenlayer today. Like Eigenlayer pre-slashing is basically access to like, you know, the airdrop whitelists, right? Um, and when it's, there is slashing, I think there will be protocols that still launch on eigenlayer with no slashing or like more explicitly you know kind of like binance launch pool like hey put your assets here uh as a indication of you know interest and we will reward you uh when we launch or something like that and so yeah totally i i, I could absolutely see like really the growth aspect of why people will launch on eigenlayer being stretched to the extreme through something like that i i think you could argue that there are a lot of like delegated proof of stake systems that are already walking this line. So if you look across all the Cosmos chains, uh, of, of course they do have slashing. Um, many, you know, many or most don't have any slashing for liveness. And so the, you know, the penalty is you get jailed, you get kicked out, you lose some rewards uh, and there's a mark on your permanent record. And, and I think that, you know, if you look at, if you look at slashing and you look at sort of validator operator management across many different chains. Um, it's often more about the reputation uh, of whoever it is that's running uh, these services and less about this capital at risk. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, if you, you, know, you slash too aggressively for things that don't um, hurt the quality of your service too much, you're just gonna drive up your capital costs because users will you know, rightfully see that there's way more fun, you know, there's way more at risk um, in engaging in, in uh, staking. Uh, and so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised as well if we see uh, a relatively slow rollout um, of slashing in, in some of these AVSs um, and that we do see, you know, that this reputational element kind of live on at the operator level in particular, because as Miles said, like these operators that it's, that they don't have to have any of their own capital in any of these uh, systems they validate. Makes sense. All right, guys, good, good chat. Good uh, introduction to restaking on Empire. Any any last, uh, I guess, closing thoughts from Brandon or Miles or Westy? No, just that uh, remind people like just how early we are in this whole game, um, and that there's a lot of there's a lot of noise in the market, and that's all totally okay and natural. And um, you know, I think there's it could be looking the landscape could look very very different in just say like six to twelve months from now. Um, but you know, we're kind of along for the ride here, and yeah, excited to see how it develops. Cool. Yeah, I'll just say that there's um, there's a lot going on in restaking. I mean, we talked for <laughs> an hour and a half, and I think only got to really a portion of it. Uh, and there are still a lot of unanswered questions. Um, this is, you know, we're also just talking about Eigenlayer V1. Uh, things will change as, as the protocol is upgraded in response to demand um, from the AVS side. And uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it all how it all shapes up. But we're only at the very start of what's going to take probably a couple of years to sort out. Nice. All right, guys. Great pod. Brandon, Miles, appreciate the time. Thanks for having us, guys. Appreciate it. 
Everyone, Jason here. Thank you so much for watching today's episode. Wanted to take a quick second to thank today's title sponsor, Arbitrum. We know you are tired of on-chain experiences that have unaffordable fees and frustrating transaction speeds, and that's why we partnered with Arbitrum. You can experience frictionless trades, lightning speed, and lag-free transactions, all for pennies per transaction. Explore Arbitrum's expanding ecosystem at portal.arbitrum.io. That's portal.arbitrum.io. See you for the next episode.